Hello folks and welcome back to a tutorial this time on effects chaining. So which effects should you put at the start of the chain and which effects should you put at the end of the chain? If you're not quite sure what I'm talking about, just um, imagine you're at a rock concert and you see a guitarist. And one of those guitarists has got an incredible collection of effects pedals and you're looking at it and there, there's this box on the floor with like 5, 10, 15, 20 pedals all wired together. And I've seen guitarists with an amazing array of pedals, I don't know how they remember what each one does. And, uh, but it's really important that you get these pedals or these effects in the right order to maximize the uh, quality of sound coming out at the end. The equivalent occurs in Logic and all Dish Audio workstations and takes apply to any piece of software you're using. In uh, Logic you access your effects either in the inspector, and there they are down there, I've already got some plugged in that's switched off, and you can add more. You just click in the empty bit of box and you've got a whole array that come with Logic and you also can use third-party plugins that are compatible as well. Uh, you can also access them in the mixer. You'll see that's what an empty box looks like there, for example. And you can add in your effects there. You'll notice that if you use something recently, it appears in a recent list at the top, so that's quite handy if you you soon work out what your favourites are when they appear all the time in your recent list. I mean, Channel EQ is always there for me. So what order should you put your effects in? Well, there are conventions and there are very good ideas, but there are no rules. Just try whatever you like, and if you like the outcome, great. But applying a little bit more savvy to it can avoid things like um, nasty stereo images and confuse sort of spread distortions that just don't sound right and could reduce phase in your mixes as well so the rule of thumb if you want to go for a conventional chain of effects is to imagine your chain of effects is a piece of string and it starts off nice and brand new and tight and as it goes through the effects chain it becomes unraveled and frayed and spread until it's like all spread out all over the place you don't want it the other way around. You don't want it all spread at the start and try and bring it back in again because you can't. It, it keeps being spread and you end up with this kind of complicated, confused set of effects. So you need to work out which effects belong to the narrow bit of string, i.e. keep the string narrow, and which effects belong to the frayed, spread, um, stereotastic bit of the end of the string. Stereotastic. There's a technical word for you. <laughs> right. So things that actually deal with the character of a sound, like its tone, don't actually change the spread in any way. So you start off with things like EQ or dynamics, things to do with levels. So I typically start with EQ first in the chain. And the reason why I start with EQ is because everything that comes afterwards doesn't need to work as hard. There's no point getting your compressor to compress loads of signals that you're then going to cut out with EQ. I don't know whether it really applies to digital technology, but certainly in the days of analog, um, your compressor would be more effective if you threw less at it. And so it's worth thinking about. So what should you do with EQ? Well, it's up to you. Uh, this is a parametric EQ or paragraphic really, I suppose because uh, you've got uh, the graphic representation and you've got the parametric control where you can access any frequency and manipulate it in different ways. This is what the top part sounds like. But because I've got a bottom bit with the same instrument, I want it to stand out a bit more by being thinner and brighter. Um, so I switch the uh, channel EQ on and I've already got some adjustments in there I'll just take that one out I've already cut some bottom end off just very slightly because I don't need it but uh, when you play the channel EQ gives you a spectrum analyzer so you can see where the fundamental frequencies are peaking through so the loudest bits in that spectrum analyzer are going to be the fundamental frequencies for your notes also the change depending on which notes you're playing but generally the main emphasis of this piano part is in this kind of middle part of the spectrum. So, so if I put a quite quite a broad parametric boost in there, it should help those sing out a bit more. Could make it even broader. 
but then I'm getting too many frequencies. I can make it more pinpointed if I wanted to. But then, then certain notes would be benefit from it. So. Really, I could take a much more bottom end off because I don't need any of that bottom end. So I'm basically for these frequencies. By the time I send it to the compressor, I'm sending silence. The compressor doesn't have to worry about any signals coming through there. So there you go first in the chain EQ. Next in the chain compressor because compressor doesn't change the thickness of that string either. It just changes the levels. Here's the compressor. I always switch off all my automatic gain controls and things like that because I like to set a compressor to the actual sound and set it the way it should be. So I'm going to start off with just um, typically somewhere around minus 30 to minus 20 decibels for a threshold. That's the point where a compressor kicks in in the signal pass. You've got to remember if you look at this meter here, zero is the point of distortion. So we measure everything below it in minus figures. Obviously, minus 30 in real life is 30 decibels below silence. is isn't such a thing. But in music technology, we refer to minus figures of decibels to mark the amount of level below the point of distortion, and then the plus figures of decibels to show the amount we've gone over into distortion. So there's your zero there. Minus 30 means that right down here, the signal only has to get that far before it starts being compressed. So I'm actually a bit more reserved and go for minus 20, which is more up here. It means uh, that only really the very loudest bits are going to get compressed. The bits below are not going to be touched by this. The ratio is how much you compress by. And the higher you turn this up, the more it's going to push it down to the point where it's more or less limiting. A limiter actually slices things off. So it limiters like a exact same as compressor, just uh, it doesn't bother with nudging things, it just goes whoop, you're not going any further. So I'm gonna try just a small amount of compression. And I'm gonna set my make up here back to zero where it should be, and you will hear now that the piano is is perceived to be quieter. I have to switch it on of course, that would help. Just gonna power up. And you can see in the meter here the how much we're losing in terms of gain. That's called your gain reduction. It's going to about minus six. And can you hear that's made the piano sound a lot more mellow? It would sound even more mellow if I moved this attack control here. So at the moment it was on like 50 milliseconds, which means that when the threshold is reached. There's a delay of 50 milliseconds before the compressor kicks in. It just allows, like if there's a loud sound at the start, like you get with the piano, bang, it's a percussive sound, isn't it? It allows that to cut through before it's compressed and leaving you just the tone of the piano to be compressed. Can be very useful. We would take it right down to zero, so there's no delay at all. As soon as we hit the threshold, it's going to compress. It means that hammer-on sound of the uh, hammer hitting the string is also going to be squashed. So let's see what that sounds like. So it's really quite mellow now, which is nice. You could compromise and have somewhere in between. Right. The knee is basically the curve between the point the compressor starts and the compressor finishes its manoeuvre. So whether it's straight there or it does it in a curve. And you get different results. So this is going to be very subtle for this one. So that's much more harsh. So that's what they call a hard knee. And that's a soft knee over here. And one more thing to be aware of is release, which is how quickly the compressor switches off after it's fallen below threshold. I've got it on something like 300 odd milliseconds. Oh yeah, 330 milliseconds, quite long. If you can reduce it, do. 
Well, of course you can, you just turn the dial. But what I mean is that watch out for things sort of feeling a bit bouncy, particularly something mellow like this. So let's see what it sounds like. No, that's fine. Um, because if you get a quick release, it basically means the compressor can recover in time to effectively compress the next bit. Makes any sense. Right, the last thing to make up then is, because we have changed things a bit, is I'm going to replace what we've lost in perceived loudness. So let's just watch this graph again and see how much we've lost. Minus five, isn't it? A bit more about uh, minus six or seven. There we go. Obviously, it doesn't have to be exactly the same as when you started. Okay, so I'm you can see down here, I'm actually going over 6.4 decibels over distortion. I mean, logic copes it very well, but uh, I'm gonna have to address that separately. So my string so far is still very thin. I've not done anything which kind of splits the signal and starts jumbling up and making it all frayed and um, glistening and all sorts of pretty things. Um, so at this point onwards, I can start splitting the string up now and making it a bit more uh, ensemble-y and spread, which is strange. So I've got ensemble next in the chain. Ensemble is a, a modulation effect you got in Logic, which essentially allows you to split the waveform three ways and change its each the modulation on each one. So you end up with this kind of uh, variance and um, choral type effect. I've just used a preset called Screen Door, and it gave me quite a nice glisten to this top line. Strangely there, because uh, I did actually bring this in after, I'd already added uh, echo and reverb and I put it before them, but I'd already got the effect there. I've not actually heard that before now without the reverb on it. It sounds like a honky tonk. It's obviously uh, manipulating the tuning here. So essentially I've now split the string. It's now starting to get spread and it's turned into a bit of a honky tonk sound. And this at this point, do you add echo? Do you add reverb? Well, I always tend to put echo before reverb if I'm using the two together. Uh, because then each signal can then be reverbed as opposed to trying to echo the reverb itself and it will that will just end up like confusing the uh, diffusion and decay of the reverb itself so I always put echo before reverb and for this one i've used a very very subtle delay synced the project it's subtle because i've brought the wet signal right down so you only just hear it if it was high you'd hear like the um the repeat, very distinctive, ding, 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 ding. So I've got quite a bit of feedback, so it repeats quite a few times, but with a low mix for the wet, 100% dry, so I get all the original signal through. I've ended up with this. Starting to get a bit dreamy now. Okay, and then the reverb. Well, I just switched it on and I went, I like that. I didn't fiddle with this at all. So this is kind of what it came up with, this, this silver verb. I haven't really used it very much. So with things like reverbs, do go and use the preset. They're usually really good. Uh, so there we go with this preset. And now I've got that really, really kind of like dripping water piano, as one way to describe it. Really dreamy. And because I've also EQ'd the bottom part, the accompaniment, to push the bass, not so much mid. I've made it more sort of deep and muddy sounding. I've compressed it uniquely. Back the same reverb to it, so it's in the same space. And 
the two complement each other now. So there we are, I've hopefully shown you what kind of effects you might want to use to make things sound interesting, but also, more importantly, the order they come in. Try it out, try and stick to the convention, and you'll see that things will work. Break the convention, and I'm sure you'll have fun. There's nobody going to stand over you with a stick and tell you you can't do it. You might like the outcome. All right, so don't listen to people who say, there's only one way to do it, and that's my way. This is just a little bit of a tip. Try it out and have fun, that's the main thing. Right, thanks for watching. Take care.